Um, my name's Craig Dunton. Um, I'm here with two hats on today. Uh, I work on the Avon Valley project, um, which many of you will know um, is a landscape scale conservation project uh, focused on habitat connectivity um, in the Avon Valley catchment in South Devon. Um, this is led by Devon Wildlife Trust and supported by South Devon Nature Trust. But I'm also here um, as Grey Long in Bat Project Officer, um, which I work for Bat. Bat uh, Bat Conservation Trust as part of the Bat from the Brink um, suite of projects uh, that are funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, so I, I kind of have two hats uh, most of my work in life. Um, <clears throat> at some point in this presentation is a mistake. Um, <laughs> an anomaly um, for which the first person to shout out what it is will win a prize. <laughs> this is an effort to uh, try to um, hold your attention. <laughs> <laughs> And I apologise for any uh, mistakes that are unintentional. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a few quick UK bats facts. Um, bats are the only truly flying mammal. Um, they're the only mammal that has proper powered flight. There are other mammals that um, fly, um, but they're only really falling with style. Um, things like <laughs> flying squirrels and flying lemurs. Um, bats are the only things that have proper, truly powered flight like birds. Um, they're mostly nocturnal, um, I say mostly because you can occasionally see bats out during the daytime. I've seen a little Benton's bat foraging over a pond in midsummer at midday. Um, it's usually because they're really hungry or thirsty or they've been disturbed from a roost, um, but they, they do occasionally come out during the day. Um, they hibernate in winter, so they enter a state of torpor, so they basically shut, shut down all their body's resources, so their, their, um, their breathing and heart rate um, drastically reduces, so they basically save 50 to 90% of their energy. Um, this is basically because there's no food around in winter for them to eat. Um, and in the UK, they are purely insectivorous. Um, they eat a wide range of insects, um, from small flies to moths to uh, caddisflies, to dung beetles, a um, huge range of insects, um, depending on um, the species, usually related to the size. Um, some. Uh, um, there are a range of different things abroad. Um, some eat frogs, some eat fish, some that drink blood. Um, there are, you know, there's, there's, there's a hugely diverse um, order. Um, Internationally, there are about 1,400 bat species. Um, this is sort of rapidly in increasing as new ones are, are discovered. Um, there are probably ones that we haven't discovered that have gone extinct. Um, and this accounts for about 20% of the world's mammals. So a hugely important order in terms of uh, international um, sort of, uh, percentages of, of mammals. Um, and in the UK, bats make up about a third of our native mammals. Um, we have 17 breeding species here in the UK, and we're very lucky in Devon that we've got 16 of these 17 breeding species. So something that um, I often get asked is how bats are faring um, in this country. In 2017, the Bat Conservation Trust, um, in collaboration with JNCC, brought out the State of UK Bats report. Um, this basically um, suggested that most bats that we were able to monitor are, are fairly stable or recovering. So, good news. Um, this kind of highlights that the current legislation that protects bats um, and conservation efforts from various projects is really important work and, and should continue. Um, but to put that in context, um, this monitoring has only been really carried out from sort of the 90s. Um, we've lost a whole load of species and habitats um, post-war um, that we we just don't really know um, about numbers. So we're starting from you know, probably quite a low baseline, so for that context. Um, recent you know, recent um, trends are we're on the up, but we're starting from a low, a low point. What's the units on the left hand side? Uh, sorry, um, it's a bit of a weird index. So, so um, some of the uh, data is from hibernation surveys, some of it's from um, roost counts, and some of it's from um, water weight surveys. Um, so the answer to that is I don't know. No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how they work out that index. Um, yeah, it, depending on the species, some are, some are going up. Um, so if one of the ones going up is the Greater Horseshoe. Um, a lot of that is possibly to do with the Greater Horseshoe Bat project and other projects that have been working in the past. Um, and then some other species, uh, like the brown long-eared, uh, the one in red, um, a very common species going down. So um, it varies really. So these um, are UK bat population estimates. Um, we don't have data for all of our species because bats are really difficult to monitor. Um, some of the species are really elusive. Um, they're nocturnal, they hide in tiny little cracks and crevices in buildings and trees. So there's a lot of data missing on our, on our, our bat species. Um, so populations of the different species vary massively. So some of the rarer ones, greater horseshoe, um, Becksteins, could be in sort of tens of thousands, and then sort of common and soprano fish trail, sort of three or four million. So um, it's, I'll, I'll talk about some reasons um, behind this. Um, no, the grey long-eared bat lot is um, population estimates for about a thousand individuals in the whole country. Um, we don't really know if it's our rarest bat because there are bats that we just don't have the data for, so we can't really say it's our rarest. But the data we do have, um, the grey long-eared is, is the rarest. So a little bit about habitat requirements uh, for bats in general. Uh, they need roosting sites. Um, so this can be uh, quite often buildings or um, uh, caves and mines. So depending on the species, they'll use different things to roost in. Um, some bats are very specific to buildings. Um, the grey longed loves big Devon stone buildings um, with slate roofs and big open roof spaces. Um, some bats are very specific to roosting in trees. Um, many bats will use caves and mines um, and cellars for hibernating because um, that sort of static temperature is really good for them. Another critical uh, thing in the landscape that bats need are their foraging sites, so places where they can go out, fly around, um, eat as many moths and other insects as they can. Um, and a key thing in the landscape for bats is that um, all-important habitat connectivity that we're probably always hearing about. So bats will use linear features to navigate through the landscape, so things like hedgerows, uh, watercourses, arable margins, um, anywhere that um, creates a linear feature that they can use their echolocation to be able to have, uh, to be able to navigate through the landscape. So this enables them to get from their roosting sites to their foraging sites and, and back again. <coughs> so I don't really expect you to be able to read all of this, but um, this is just a table showing um, the, uh, the bat species in this country, the um, different foraging habitats that they use, and then their diet. Um, so one thing I wanted to, um, to be able to sort of get across is um, some of the different habitats, um, the, the key habitats that bats use for foraging. So in green is woodland, so different, different types of woodland. Um, could be ancient woodland, could be wet woodland, could be plantation. Um, red is meadows and grassland. And blue is uh, wet features, so um, lakes, ponds, rivers, um, canals. Um, so, and then in black is kind of lots of other different things that are probably more marginal. Um, so, to highlight, you know, those three key habitats are of critical importance for, for a lot of bat species. Um, but in terms of meadows, um, there are only five species that. Um, are very much um, associated with meadows. Uh, the barbastel, associated with wet meadows. Uh, the common pipistrelle um, is recorded a lot in, in grasslands. Um, the greater horseshoe, uh, very much associated with grazing pasture because they like to eat dung beetles. Um, the grey longed, very much uh, associated with lowland meadows, uh, wet meadows and marshes. And then the lesser horseshoe, which is also associated with pasture and with some wet meadows as well. Um, I'm going to talk about four of those species. I'm not going to talk about the common pipistrelle um, because um, they are they're very op opportunistic. They basically forage anywhere and everywhere. Um, so the fact that they get picked up on grasslands um, quite a lot doesn't really demonstrate that they've um, evolved to use them. Whereas the other species are very much specialised to 
species rich grassland. And when I'm, when I'm talking about um, bats using grassland, I'm generally talking about well managed grassland, so you know, nice hay meadows, um, semi improved grassland, um, low, 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 low intensification agriculture. So, our first bat. Um, if I wasn't a very long eared bat project officer, this would be my favourite bat. Um, so the Barber Stell uh, is a medium sized bat, so wingspan of 26 to 29 centimetres. Um, it's a really distinctive bat, it's very black. Um, it's, um, it's, it's the only bat that is, is purely black, but it has these, um, I don't know if you can really see it in that photo, but it has sort of very white tips to its fur. Um, it's got this really characteristic sort of pug face. Um, a lot of people think it's ugly, but quite beautiful really um, and it's one of the only bats that um, its ears join over the top of its head um, so the other bats that do that are the, the long ears um, it's got a very close relationship with ancient woodland uh, for its roosting so the barbastel favours uh, sort of standing stems of, of dead trees um, if, you, if you've got a dead tree and the, the bark is starting to, to flake off on the plate uh, that's where the barbastel likes to, likes to roost um, so it generally needs um, lot, fairly large areas of ancient woodland where there are lots of these um, dead trees because the, uh, the nature of those roosts are they're really transitory, so um, it needs um, unmanaged um, woodland really, um, ancient woodland to, for roosting. Uh, and it has this very close relationship with wet meadows, so it um, comes out of its ancient woodland and then forages around uh, wet meadows, uh, but also over the, the tops of um, the woodland canopy. So this is one of the uh, bat species that has quite a close relationship with the uh, tympanate moths. So there are uh, um, a, a group of moths that have evolved, co-evolved with bats um, to be able to be able to hear their echolocation. Um, they don't really hear, but they have like a, a membrane somewhere on their body that enables them to pick up bats' echolocation. Um, and this is one of the bats that, that feeds on those. Uh, it's a very rare bat, only found in sort of south central England and Wales, um, and it feeds on small moths, uh, flies, and beetles. So, the greater horseshoe bat is uh, jointly our biggest bat, so wingspan of 35 to 40 centimetres. If you see something big flying around, that's um, probably going to be a greater horseshoe or a nocturne, which they kind of jointly are the UK's biggest bat. Um, it has this fascinating horseshoe shaped nose leaf, which you probably can't really see in that picture. Um, but it's one of our two horse horseshoe species um, that has this horseshoe shaped nose leaf. Um, as I said earlier, it's got a very close relationship with cattle grazed pasture. Uh, during its uh, maternity period, um, one of the most important food sources for it um, are, are dung beetles um, and also cockchafers. Um, because it's quite a big bat. It, Needs sort of big insects to get the amount of protein and energy that it needs. Uh, they generally roost in buildings, caves, and mines. Uh, it's very restricted to the southwest of England and South Wales, and, uh, and there's its diet there. So, chafers, dung beetles, uh, nocturne moths, um, crane flies, and caddis flies. So, uh, Anna David, which some of you may know from the Great Horseshoe Bat Project, um, has asked me to and a few slides um, about the, the Devon Great Horseshoe Bat Project. Um, so, um, <coughs> the project's been running for several years now. Um, it's basically focusing on the maternity areas of the Great Horseshoe Bat. Some of them have had some involvement with, with Anna and, or someone else on the team. Um, so they have 11 priority areas where they're working with landowners um, and communities uh, to try and raise awareness and to um, encourage conservation of this species. Um, so they have um, a pot of funding, if you're within one of their project areas, they have a pot of funding available for um, practical works on farms. Um, they can help with planning worming regimes, which is really important for um, managing um, worming for, in, ter in terms of dung beetle um, management. Um, some uh, wormers, the abomectins, have a really detrimental impact on dung beetle populations. Um, they can help with countryside stewardship applications, and give advisory visits. <coughs> One of the really good things about this project is they can loan out bat detectors. 
So if, you've, um, if you want to monitor bats on your land, you can borrow a bat detector from this project. Um, you want to tell people that's for the whole county, not just yes. 11 spots? Sorry, not, say, not, not just 11 spots on the map. Oh yes, yeah, so yeah, anywhere in the county, for the Devon Bat Survey. Um, yeah, it's not just for the project area, for the Great Bushy Bat, it's anywhere in the county. They're basically building up a big map of uh, bat data in the whole county. So, um, yeah, go online and we'll talk to Lynn or I and we can um, give you some more details. Um, there's loads of info in the other room um, about the Great Bushy project. Um, yeah, like I said, yeah, talk to Lynn or myself and we can put you in the right direction. So the next part, the lesser horseshoe. Um, so in this photo you can really see the horseshoe-shaped nose leaf. Um, so yes, the, uh, the other one of our horseshoe species. Um, very small bat, so 20 to 25 centimetre wingspan. Um, restricted to Wales, Western England, Western Ireland. Uh, very much um, a forager along woodland edge, um, pasture as well, um, wetlands and meadows. Um, and it likes to roost in buildings. So this bat, because it's a lot smaller, feeds on a lot smaller things. So flies, midges, um, mosquitoes, small moths, caddisflies, lacewings, beetles, small wasps and spiders. So this is one of the bats that we'll be able to... Um, so bats will generally feed in, in one of two ways. Uh, they, they either catch insects on the wing, so which is called hawking, so basically just um, flying along and just eating whatever's flying in front of them, um, and also uh, a method called gleaning, so they can, some bats can fly up to um, vegetation or spider webs and be able to basically hover and take insects um, from um, wherever. So, um, but yeah, this is one of the ones that um, can take stationary insects. And onto the grey long-eared bat. Uh, yeah, like I said earlier, uh, possibly our rarest bat in the country. Um, it's a medium-sized bat, so its uh, wingspan is 25 to 30 centimetres. Um, it's got incredibly long ears, hence the name. Uh, they're about 4 to 5 centimetres long, so about the same length of, um, as its body. It's very similar to the much more common brown long eared bat, but it's greyer. Uh, these two bats are really difficult to identify. Um, this, it generally takes very experienced ecologists to be able to identify them in the hand. Um, in terms of the echolocation, bats echolocate at lots of different frequencies and you can identify some species through the echolocation. These ones are very similar to the brown long ear, so it's an, another way that we can't really distinguish them. Um, so yeah, very, very tricky species, so possibly a bit under-recorded, um, but um, Unlikely. Um, the, the DNA analysis um, of many roosts in, in Devon suggests that they are, they are very rare. Um, so they weigh about 12 grams, about the same as a two pound coin. And their favourite foods are noctuid moths, so some of the yellow underwings that Phil was talking about earlier, um, and tapulidae, which are crane flies. So um, the larval form of crane flies are leather jackets, which are a really serious agricultural pest, so that's one thing you can say to farmers, <laughs> um, really good to have more bats in the landscape. So just a very brief bit about the project. Um, this bat is only found in England. Um, there's one record in Pembrokeshire of Wales. We don't really know why um, that one record popped up. There's basically um, maternity colonies only found in Devon, Dorset, um, and the Isle of Wight, just basically scattered along the south coast. <coughs> it's a bit of a warm weather bat, um, and it likes very good quality habitat, hence it just being found along the south coast. Um, so my project area, a uh, little patch in the south hand, so these purple circles are um, sustenance zones around uh, maternity colonies. So bats will forage out into the landscape, generally a certain distance from where their, their maternity colonies are. So I've got a patch in the south hands. Um, Team Valley, uh, X Valley, and then a couple in East Devon. And the red dots are grey long eared records. So these are pretty much all of the grey long eared records for Devon. Um, so they're, they're not very well recorded at all, um, just because there aren't that many of them. Um, and the black line is uh, what we call a least cost path. So um, working with landowners along this route as well, because this is deemed to be 
the most uh, the easiest route for them to be able to get between their populations. So in terms of landowner engagement, um, we've talked to about 100 landowners so far about their land management concerning grey longhead bats. Uh, one of the things we're doing uh, is habitat creation and restoration, so trying to um, encourage more species rich grassland and meadows. Um, so we're helping with um, providing seed and management advice. Uh, okay, and so just a few take home messages. Um, many of our rarest bat species are reliant on extensively managed grasslands, so everything that you guys are doing is really important um, for this species and, and many of our, our really rare bat species. Um, these really rare ones quite often have a very close relationship with species rich grassland because they've sort of co-evolved with it, um, but most, if not all, other bat species would use meadows if they came across them. Um, just simply the, the sheer abundance of insects that um, wildfire meadows support is really important for that sort of bulk of, of protein um, that, that bats need. Uh, many of our rarer species are restricted to the south, so Devon is a really important county uh, for meadows. Um, one thing we need to think about is, is climate change and the way that's going to impact our, um, some, some of our species and their um, ability to move through the landscape. So we have populations of grey long-eared bats in, in the south of the county. We've just picked up a population in the very north of the county. Um, so as as the climate shifts, the work you're doing on Dartmoor um, is going to be even more important um, for the future to be, for species like the Great Long Bat to be able to move through the landscape to have really good habitat to forage over. Um, and I think livestock grazing is a really important component of creating species rich grassland. Um, getting the, the sort of bulk of um, material off and, and nitrogen off um, that um, you know cattle grazing can do, um, but also providing dung um, for beetles um, for a lot of um, the bigger species. Um, so very briefly, very, very briefly a bit about um, some other mammals. Um, brown hare and harvest mouse um, are associated with wildflower meadows. Um, both of these species need uh, wildflower meadows as part of the habitat mosaic, so that kind of old um, sort of farm system um, is really important to have like those different types of habitat um, in the landscape. Um, and then also wild meadows can support a whole range of um, our more common mammals. Um, I think as conservationists we need to be very aware that our um, recently, historically, our really common species are declining. So we need to be keeping an eye on even the most common things um, and be aware that you know, if things like you know, field voles and trees start to massively decline, then we're potentially in big trouble. So, um, so that's me. Um, there's some of my funders. Um, that's me done. Thank you. We missed the mistake. Greater Horseshoe are really quite um, uh, loyal to their race. 
Okay. Um, so they can go back year after year if you know if it's still in the right condition. Um, in terms of foraging distance, it also depends on the species. Um, Greater horseshoes need to be about four kilometres from the maternity colony. Yeah. Um, okay. Great long is about five kilometres. So if something got destroyed, you know, like a barn where they used to roost, what, where, where would they find the nearest place, or does that affect the...? Um, yeah, it, I mean, potentially if they can find somewhere suitable to roost again, then they might take that. Um, if they can't, then, yeah, <laughs> they probably won't breed and they'll probably die out in that, in that area. Okay, well thank you very much indeed.